Hello, good afternoon. My name is Philip Preston and I'd like to welcome you to today's Webinar Express, leading through turnaround and transformation organised by CIM Southwest. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short 10 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the Ask a Question chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop or across the top if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we're using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar has been recorded and we'll share the link to the recording with you over the next few days. And finally, you'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the event, which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes and all survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. So, I'd now like to hand over to Gordon Seabright, who was our guest speaker today. Well, thank you very much, Phil. Um, this is me. Uh, I'm now Chief Executive of Creative Land Trust. I've only been there a year, so uh, it is not yet time for a turnaround or transformation. But uh, what I am going to talk about is some of the stuff I've done before that. And um, immediately beforehand, up to about a year ago, I was the Chief Executive of the Eden Project down in Cornwall. I was there for uh, about five years. Before that, I ran the National Cycling Charity and spent a period running the Royal Horticultural Society. So why should I be able to say anything about transformations? Well, um, here's the great transformation, the first of three transformations I'll talk about at Eden. And this is the one uh, that I think gives me and I hope everybody faith in the possibility of achieving the impossible through transformation. So this is a, a picture of the landscape that became Eden um, from uh, just when the idea had come up. Uh, and it's an insane idea to take the, uh, the most uh, destroyed landscape in the poorest part of the UK. Um, so the St Austell area of Cornwall and turn it into uh, something really, really special. Uh, it was a China clay quarry. To get China clay, you blast away all the all the rock um, with with high pressure water hoses and you are left ultimately with a, a big hole. And the big hole has uh, no uh, no rock, no soil, therefore no plants, therefore no insects, there no therefore no birds, got no life of any kind. It is probably uh, the, the finest example of how man can destroy a landscape. And um, and so the first transformation that Eden had was was moving it to this. This photo was taken last year. I mean, it's now an absolutely beautiful place, got the world's largest rainforest in captivity in a bubble there. It's got mature plants uh, all the way around. Um, uh, it's often described as the eighth wonder of the world. There's 5000 rock pins holding up the sides. The bottom is 14 metres below the water table, so there's all sorts of interesting engineering going on. And more importantly, it shows that which is possible and it was intended to show people that, um, that uh, we shouldn't despair and that however much of a mess that people have made of the earth, if we all work together in communities and in harmony with nature, then it is possible to save a place. And that was the first transformation and two million people came the first year and um, it was an amazing success and it has transformed Cornwall as well as the Eden Project. But then came the need for the second transformation because over time there was a bit of drift and a lack of investment in the site and the visitor numbers fall away. Um, however completely wonderful the attraction is, people have seen it once and they thought that they'd seen it enough and we reached the point that we were down around 700,000 visitors a year and that really wasn't enough to pay the bills. And you started getting a, a bit of a cycle of problems with uh, the debt levels growing, therefore the a lack of investment in the proposition, therefore fewer people coming to see it, and also a loss of support from the from the local community who are taking it for granted for a number of reasons that I can go into, and a bit of a drift away from what the initial purpose was. And Eden got into a bit of trouble and it was 
still bumping along OK. And then we had um, 2012, which um, where, where there was a sort of perfect storm and combination of the Olympics hoovering up all the tourists and unfavorable weather meant that Eden really hit the buffers financially. And it was time for another uh, turnaround. Uh, they began uh, just before I arrived, bringing about a turnaround. And I'll say something about that turnaround. And my observation is that turnarounds have three phases. There's the one that everybody knows about, the one that makes the newspapers, the financial turnaround. And at Eden, that was fairly dramatic. Um, it was uh, about driving down the debt and uh, therefore being making it possible to focus whatever expenditure there was, focus that expenditure on investment, uh, on stuff that people wanted to come and see, including events, being ruthless on other costs, and therefore starting to get the visitor numbers up and getting into a virtuous circle of increased profitability, and reduced indebtedness, less money going out in interest payments. That's the bit of turnaround that everybody is, I guess, familiar with. And it's a story that you often hear about corporate entities as well as charities. And I would say, um, without being glib about it, that's the straightforward bit of turnaround. It's not easy, but it is fairly simple. Spend less, focus your investment. My, my learning at Eden was that there are two other phases of turnaround which are trickier. And the second is how the rest of the world feels about you. Um, and uh, we found that the rest of the world didn't like us quite as much as we thought. And um, and we looked back afterwards and we got a good understanding of that. We realized that, um, as one of my colleagues always said, we'd, we'd sort of behave like unruly teenagers, as though the world owes us a bit of a living and was lucky to have us there. And actually, when push came to shove, we didn't have quite as many friends as we had hoped. We couldn't get quite as much support either from local government initially um, or from national government. That came as a bit of a shock. So then we had to do a lot of work on changing the way the rest of the world felt about us. And that actually meant um, doing the hard yards of, of going out there and and uh, changing our attitude and showing that to people. Um, all my colleagues, we all served on any number of other boards to try and make ourselves useful. And we turned Eden into a bit of a convening space. We we used to say if uh, if Cornwall was a village, we wanted to be the village hall where people came together. And over time, we felt we made Cornwall fall back in love with us. But even that's not the hardest part of a transformation. I mean, the hardest part of a transformation is how you feel about yourselves. And it was unsurprising that after a couple of hundred redundancies, people at Eden felt pretty battered and they were finding it hard to feel proud of the place they worked. And so a huge amount of effort went in to turning that around. And I had learned something in my time at the Royal Horticultural Society on on what that meant. It meant face to face time. Eden has a little bit more than 500 staff. That is that is not so many that you can't actually speak to everybody in small groups and talk about what's going on and bang on about what the plan is to turn it around and get everybody engaged in that plan and crucially give everybody a clear focus. The focus we came up with was this and it might surprise you but um, although everybody originally knew what Eden was there for there hadn't been what I would call a strategy. There hadn't been a clear plan of what we were going to do and the danger there is that you're relying on everybody's shared understanding without knowing that it exists. And you have the risk that people start doing stuff that they know kind of fits with the ethos. But effectively, it's pursuing hobbies. It's doing it in the most well-intentioned way. But you can end up with a group of intellectual magpies who are all running towards the, the, the latest shiny thing. And that matters. Because when you've got limited resources, you need to focus them in the right place. And so a huge part of what we did in that first couple of years of turnaround was actually the very basic thing of clarifying what are we here for? Agreeing it, finding a form of shared words that we could we could all use and getting everybody lined up behind it and making sure. And there is no limit to the number of times that you can say this stuff and share this stuff and share conversations about it. And so at the bottom of the slide there, you can see that we, we came up with a strap line, 
which was around transformation. And we went through our second transformation. And that is a nice recovery story, but it's not a recovery story that ends, ends there. Von Moltke, the general, doesn't honestly have many things to commend him, but he did say this, this very uh, profound thing that no plan reaches with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy. Uh, I, I, Mike Tyson, the boxer, put it uh, in a, a, another way. He said everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, that was the experience for us. And we had no sooner got our place in shape than these things happened. Now, Eden is there to show the power of transformation. It's, it's an environmental charity. And yet we still found ourselves a little bit wrong footed by a 15 year old, she was then, Swedish schoolgirl, and by the Extinction Rebellion guys. We found that actually the stuff we'd been talking about in what we thought was a very clear way for 18 years at that point, well, we were at risk of being pushed aside, of being ignored, of being irrelevant in the debate because the world had moved on. And we had to we had to figure out what we were going to do about that. I am um, for the benefit of anybody who's interested in business school diagrams. I, I put it onto this where we described it as our pivot point, that our start point was that we had become stable. We had looked after the organisation that we were to the point that we could feel confident again. And then we bumped into this massive discontinuity that the world recognised a climate emergency. And there were other things going on as well. The key one being that we needed to show that we were still relevant and we were at real risk of not hearing that. So we had to figure out what to do about that threat. And um, and the thing that we had learned from our previous transformation, our second transformation about bringing everybody together came in again. We brought the whole team together, We brought everybody into gatherings where we talked about this issue and we were on some occasions quite surprised by the results. I mean, we found, for example, that uh, loads of the Eden team were urging us to declare a climate emergency. And of course, a lot of organisations were doing that. It surprised us because we kind of thought that we declared a climate emergency by founding the place. Um, but actually, we needed to be explicit. And we pulled together all the stuff that came from our team. We wrote up another strategy. We created an action plan. I know it sounds like jargon, but actually we needed a plan because Eden's a complex place and we needed to focus all our resources and all our, the possible channels that we had on bringing about the changes that we needed to retain our relevance and make a difference. Um, after all, nobody working in, who works in a charity, you know, getting getting paid too little and working too long hours if they're not passionate about making a difference. So we did a number of things. One of the most important things in the Eden year is is the summer programme. Uh, in simple terms, Eden needs to get about a quarter of a million people through the doors during the summer holiday six weeks in order to fund what's going on during the rest of the year. I mean, that's the nature of business in Cornwall. But we were perhaps weren't using our time with those quarter of a million people as well as we could have done to tell the stories that really mattered. So we changed our summer programme. And instead of um, doing a blockbuster on the stuff we had done before, like space or dinosaurs, we did a rather daring summer programme on the subject of biodiversity and mass extinction. It's not classic box office, but actually we found that we it gave us the opportunity to share thoughts and concerns and hope with that quarter of a million people. And while they were there seeing what we can show, share with them about the planet, seeing a, a rainforest in the southwest of the UK, uh, learning stories about the charities who are doing great work and the countries who are doing great work, but also learning about what we're losing and how quickly we're losing it. We, were, we asked them a load of questions and we gave them a load of tools. Um, we set up these kiosks where people could get advice on what they could do to make a difference. We called it make the change. Just little things that they could do um, now, we weren't trying to be po-faced about it. The people who come to Eden in that summer six weeks, generally it's their one holiday week of the year. God, holidays, remember that. Um, and they would come and not want to be preached at. 
So it was more about giving people that sense of, of hope and possibility of what they could do and therefore showing them that Eden had something to tell them. And we got people to make pledges if they wanted to. And almost two thirds of people who came made a pledge. And it might be as simple as I'm going to put my recycling in the right bin. It all helps. It all adds up. And inspired by our experience with that, we decided to carry it through to our other programmes when we had when we were really busy. So this is a picture actually of that year's Christmas campaign. And we've in inside one of the biomes, we put uh, massive artwork it's by an artist called Luke Jerram. And it's called, as you can imagine, Earth. Um, and we would hang that up so that uh, and it is it is huge um, and play the lights on it so that um, at that moment when people were perhaps listening to a choir and drinking some mulled wine, they also had a moment, uh, a reason to reflect on the uh, fragility and beauty of our planet. And there were a load of other activities around this that were relevant to it. The Father Christmas story had uh, a strong environmental action angle that gave kids something they could take away and do that would make a difference. Um, just out of frame here, there's actually a, a Christmas jumper swap shop. So that instead of um, going to Asda to buy a new hideous acrylic Christmas jumper, you could swap your hideous acrylic Christmas jumper with somebody else. A whole set of activities that made Christmas relevant to our message around the environment. We also invested heavily in art. Art, as you can imagine from my current job, is a bit of a passion of mine. We we raised money to um, install a number of major artworks, notably the one on the left here, and no photograph is ever going to do infinity blue justice. But what it is, is an eight and a half metre tall ceramic sculpture of a cyanobacteria, which is a, a microscopic uh, creature that um, billions of years ago belched and farted enough oxygen into the atmosphere um, that life could evolve. And you can see our uh, cyanobacteria uh, belching out smoke rings. Smoke rings are O's, O's for oxygen, very li uh, literal and yet artistic way of championing a hero of the environment. The other picture is of a an artwork called Bird's Eyes, and, um, and that's a hundred replica eyes of birds that either, of UK based birds, that either are extinct through man's activities or are on the verge of extinction, and they're reflective. And so uh, when you are leaving the site at night, um, they stare back at you. The, the site was full of these artworks that conveyed that sort of messaging. Um, we had a way of doing it's uh, telling the same story with food as well. I mean, we all know that we've got to eat um, less meat and more plant based products. But, you know, again, you don't want to preach at people. They're supposed to be having fun. So we turned one of our cafes into um, an entirely vegetarian and vegan outlook. But it doesn't actually say that anyway. You wouldn't know it. We just tried to put on the most delicious menu of plant based meals that we possibly could. Um, and we did some little nudgy tweaks uh, to things like in, in our other outlets, we put the uh, we put the vegetarian options higher than the, the Cornish pasty on the menu. Over time, we got up to about 36 percent of the meals that we sold were vegetarian or vegan in a country where 11 percent of people are vegans. So we nudge people along with that. We nudge people along by by simply getting rid of um, selling bottles of water cost us a lot of money, about £150,000 of water bottles a year we were selling, but we just did away with it and we put taps around the place um, and uh, and encouraged people to use their own re reusable water containers. And for our gigs, uh, um, one of the nicest things at Eden is the, the, the eight or ten concerts a year that we would hold in the middle of the, the, the site. Uh, we moved them to uh, away entirely from single use plastic. And I remember the first time we did it at the end of the gig, what the team always do is go around tidying up any left behind uh, beer glasses. And that used to be a one and a half hour job. And the first gig we did away with re, uh, with uh, single use plastic, we only had eight glasses that we had to pick up. So we're using the site to tell some stories and then we went beyond that as well. And one of the things we did was rescue 
uh, an initiative called the National Wildflower Centre, which was a millenn millennium project based up in Liverpool that had fallen on hard times. And uh, the National Wildflower Centre is a wonderful thing now based at Eden in Cornwall, and it's fairly obvious what it does. It encourages the growth of wildflowers around the place for the sake of biodiversity um, and for uh, carbon reasons um, and just to encourage beauty, uh, beauty in all things. We, we felt it would be lovely if we could live in a country where kids were told do pick the flowers. Um, and so we set this, we, we, we acquired it and then we sort of really ramped it up to uh, to offer wildflower growing around the country and to build wildflowers into development schemes. There's a road in Cornwall now that is the first road, I think, in the UK to be built with the support of an environmental charity. And that's because it is absolutely festooned with wildflowers uh, and orchards and the like all the way along. We also thought, well, we're an educational charity. We already have um, 50,000 school kids a year coming here, but we need to influence. We need to have even more influence. So we went in two directions on that. We went to younger children and we set up an outdoor preschool um, for kids to learn through play in the outdoors, because if kids play in the outdoors, they're going to care more about the environment when they grow up. And we set up degree courses, notably here. Um, sustainable tourism and sustainable festival management. But there were some in horticulture as well. You can see again the the link back to the transformation that we were trying to bring about. And then and then finally among these things, uh, geothermal energy. You may have uh, be aware that um, that the southwest of England sits on very hot rocks. And if you drill a hole deep enough, and it's a deep hole, it's four and a half kilometres deep. You get down to about 180 degree temperatures if you in simple terms if you drop some cold water down the hole and wait for it to come up the neighboring hole um, you can stick a turbine on top and you can generate electricity and this was um, this was uh, a a way that we saw that Cornwall and Devon could transform the rest of the UK's energy use and so we invested in a geothermal energy scheme and uh, they're drilling right now so that um, was a whole set of things that added up to a third transformation for Eden. And the outcome has been that I think I, I, I think I feel safe in saying that Eden is is absolutely environmentally credible. And I'm excited, even though I'm no longer there to see much press reference to this. This is uh, the plan for Eden North, a uh, new Eden project in Morecambe on the Lancashire coast, um, which is are going to tell similar stories in a different way based on the sort of uh, the tidal rhythms, the amazing seascapes. The key thing I think is that Eden is sufficiently robust financially through its second turnaround and inspirational environmentally through its third to be credible in in creating the first of what I hope will be a series of new Edens. Um, so I, I did my five years there and it was time to do a different sort of transformation and I, I really wanted to work in the arts and I wanted to work in London so I moved across this new charity the uh, the Creative Land Trust and I've been able to use the things I've learned about what works in sort of what I would call 21st century transformational leadership uh, at the Creative Land Trust uh, these are qualities like uh, humility, always sounds ironic when a guest speaker talks about humility, but you get my drift. Um, kindness, decency, authenticity, basic stuff. I used to cycle around Eden instead of driving. Having your sleeves rolled up, uh, the, the thing I would always bang on about with my colleagues there was about, you know, we wanted people who were on the pitch playing rather than in the stands shouting. If you want to bring about a turnaround, that is absolutely what you need. A flat hierarchy, hugely important at both Eden and at my current place. Um, a lot of people report to me. I think it's absolute nonsense to say everybody should have four or six direct reports. Actually, if you want to be able to pull all the levers, then you don't want hierarchy. You don't want people focused on the big boss at the top. You want everybody sharing and a relentless focus, relentless. Everything's got to be in service of that big plan. So Creative Land Trust, as I say, we've been set up to bring about a transformation. We've been set up because um, a number of people, notably 
the Mayor of London and the Arts Council for England and also Bloomberg Philanthropies realise that London has this this um, this amazing quality of creativity, which it stands behind the success of the city over hundreds of years. You know, why is London a globally successful financial centre? Well, it's not down to the weather that pe bring, bring people here. It's because it's the most creative city. The trouble is, artists tend to be the ones who move into a difficult area and they make it a really fun area, a really exciting and vibrant area. And then the next thing that happens is they get priced out of it. And that's not mattered so much as long as there was another bit of town for them to move into. But it matters now because there isn't another bit of London for them to move into. So our job is to make sure that we have a creative workspace that is affordable for artists and that is bringing about vibrant, dynamic, creative clusters all over London, bringing neighbourhoods to life, giving jobs to young people, especially creating workspace for all those um, young people who come out of our arts university. We've got 35,000 arts graduates a year coming out and looking for places to work and they generally can't find anywhere that they can afford. So we're using the money that we raise to acquire places in the long term. The idea is to try and solve this problem once and for all and prove that it's possible to do that. Incidentally, no global city has yet managed to do this, which is part of the appeal. So we're not interested in taking places in the short term. There are plenty of very good studio organisations who do that. We're interested in permanent solutions by which we mean we take freeholds or we take ideally very long leases. Um, in certain circumstances, we look at mid term leases, looking at reasonably big buildings, uh, 10,000 square feet and up, um, because art is one of those things that benefits from people uh, working together, collaborating and the serendipity of collisions of ideas. And we want to try and curate that, if you like. And we've got to work way below market rent, 12 to 15 pounds a square foot including service charge, is what is rated, regarded by the Greater London Authority as affordable for artists. That is, anybody who's dealing with London workspace will know that is way below market rate. So we have to dream up clever ways of doing that and then work with uh, experienced studio providers. There's about 250 of them in London to make the space available. And how are we doing that? Um, well, we've got to dream up. I mean, we haven't proved it yet, but this is how we're going to do it. We're dreaming up a new blended finance model and it will bring together a number of streams of money. One will be philanthropy. So philanthropists have long been able to invest um, their money in in uh, art galleries or artworks, but not really before the places where young artists start their practice. So we're creating a, a donor scheme for philanthropists. Investment, they, we are convinced that there is a market there for what I would call patient impact investors who give a damn about art and culture to earn a, a respectable return secured on London property in the long term. Uh, and so to serve art and culture, but also also make uh, well probably rather more money than they make from investing most places at the moment. We think that we'll be successful in blending into that some grants. We think that trusts and foundations and quasi governmental organisations will be inclined to support us given what we do and the credibility that we hope that we're bringing to this uh, to this area of work. And the teeny tiny area of uh, uh, a bit of finance that we'll bring in will be our operating surplus. And that will be tiny because we'll be working sub market um, and we're a charity. Uh, so we won't be making any more money than we have to, but we would love to be contributing to to the overall ourselves, not just covering our running costs. We fairly quickly realised that just doing that is going to take a long time to um, to solve this problem for London. So we're now also working a lot through strategic partnerships, which is a much overused phrase. And what we mean is we're conveying the value of creative workspace, the value that art brings to a place. And we're working in partnership now with developers and councils and landowners so that they can feel the benefit of that and the way that the arts bring their spaces to life. 
and we can benefit from getting sub market or off market um, opportunities to acquire and operate space. And then finally, policy and influencing. We don't we don't aim to speak for the sector, but we are trying to bring about a transformation of the UK or London's initially and then the UK's arts and culture scene. We're trying to bring creativity to the heart of our cities and in part to do that, we've got to be able to influence things like planning policy, like uh, development policy for cities. We've got to get affordable creative workspace right to the heart of things. I rattled through um, some of the things that I feel are important in 21st century transformational leadership. Some of the things that matter for transformations and for turnarounds. Um, the single most important thing that I have learned, though, is this. It's a quote. I don't often do quotes on the office wall. I, that's a bit hackneyed, but I can't resist this one. Harry S. Truman maybe the most underrated of American presidents, um, and he lived by this. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And my observation about successful transformations and turnarounds is if you want them to stick, that's what's going to work. If you want to get in the newspapers and just do that financial bit where you cut stuff and stay in business, then yeah, you can go for the, the big man. Somehow it's always a man, isn't it? Um, the big man vision and, and making lots of noise and somebody gets the headlines. But actually, if you really want to bring about true change, then you, you work with a group of people who just want to deliver the change and don't care too much whether they come out smelling of roses. That's me. Um, do please feel free to get in touch with me at Creative Land Trust if you want to be a part of that transformation. And otherwise, I will be very happy now to hand back to Phil and to take any questions that you might have. OK, um, yeah. thanks very much. Thanks very much. It's, uh, great storytelling there. Yeah. We're now going to have a short 10 minute Q&A session. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the Q&A panel. There's quite a few questions, actually, so I'll try and get through as many as possible. Our first question then is uh, relating back to the early part of the presentation on, on um, Eden Project. During these challenging times for all businesses, what do you think is more important, seizing commercial opportunities or embracing your brand values? Seizing commercial opportunities without, without being um, true to your brand values I think it's a very short term way of going about things. And I appreciate that some of us at the moment feel as though we've got to be short term. One of the first things I've done since uh, arriving at Creative Land Trust has been carry out a piece of work on our brand identity so that we can fully understand, well, how is it that we want to appear to the world? And I think that's important because I guess like most organisations, we're planning to stick around for a while and we didn't want to take shortcuts. You know, we don't we 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 want to have a reputation for being the good guys and for doing the right thing. And so my perception is, yeah, you've got to be true to yourself. And if you are true to yourself and if your brand values are the right ones, then the commercial opportunities absolutely will come. OK, next question in transformation and alignment of people beyond speaking with them, what worked or what part of the message worked? It's crystal clarity, I think. I mean, it's not just speaking with them, I should say. It is listening. You know, it's a t it's a two way conversation. One of the things that I was fortunate enough to be able to do at Eden was once a year have a thing called the gathering. And the gathering is a two day affair where every single member of staff uh, spends that that two days doing shared stuff in a room. The site is closed, which is unusual. Eden normally, apart from that, really only closes on Christmas Day. Um, but we'd have two days when everybody was together and that had a couple of, of things that were valuable for really driving home transformation and making sure everybody was sharing it. One is I learned that there is no limit to the number of times you can say a thing and it being valuable. So that Harry S. Truman quote has been used um, many, many times. And I would imagine there are a few people at Eden who could quote it back. But alongside that, um, I mentioned the strategy that we wrote up. Well, we created a, um, a sort of graphic form of it so that you could grasp the whole thing and how it worked on one page. And we, we used that enough so everybody could quote it back. But the other great value 
of bringing people together and doing that face to face and i know that's hard work but uh, you know it, it works it's important the other the other great thing of that was being able to feel what's going on in the room and each year i would get up on the stage to open this thing and i could feel how people were feeling and the first couple of years you can imagine they just had massive redundancies and you could feel a tension you know is that is the new but is he going to get up and say we're losing another 100 jobs and I knew that we'd really turned a corner on that thing I was talking about, the way that you feel about yourselves. I knew we turned a corner when I just got up and there was a warm buzz and you could feel the whole room were sort of comfortable and excited about what was coming next. So, uh, yes, there's other stuff, but there is nothing to my mind that substitutes for just spending time with the whole team. Do you think environmental messages generally have got lost because of the pandemic? We had a number of questions uh, relating to the pandemic, so this is the first one. I think it's kind of everything has been uh, has disappeared down the headlines. But actually, when you think about it, the pandemic is in part an environmental crisis. Uh, and uh, I think the, the the things that we talk about in the environmental movement have never been so important. You can't imagine the pandemic without things like uh, deforestation, for example um uh without uh without uh, agriculture stretching into areas that are where agriculture doesn't belong um so uh even if we've been chased out of the headlines for a while uh, i think we will we'll be coming back and the solution to the pandemic is absolutely going to be around you know solving the same problems that we we need to tackle environmentally so how is um how is the eden project managing the current situation has it done anything different to get through this sort of virtual world that we're currently living in? Well, I'm uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not at Eden anymore, but I've uh, but I still follow the place uh, closely. I'm a lot of time in, in Cornwall when I'm allowed to go to, go to Cornwall. Um, and what Eden has been doing is, I think, a very sensible policy uh, when uh, when open of, of trying to uh, allow as many people as possible to experience the wonder of the rainforest as possible, but also continuing this plan to take the Eden message beyond beyond that bottom left corner of the UK. And I've been really interested in seeing um, in seeing the progress of it, not only Eden North, but also the work that's been going on towards uh, towards Edens in in other places, uh, uh, notably China and then the southern southern hemisphere. I think that's really important because however good Eden is in Cornwall, it's only ever going to get a million, maybe, you know, in a great year, two million people that it can influence. And actually, you're trying to change the world. So you need to do that on a bigger scale. Right. Um, question related to your current position, actually. Um, are CLT's large workspace plans still in the works? Does COVID impact upon these plans? Uh, it, it does. How it impacts is, that's the tricky thing, actually. Um, it may bring about a situation where there is more workspace available and uh, landowners are keen to take a, a lower than market with lower the current market price for it. It may. Um, it's going to bring about some challenges, especially uh, in high streets, of course, because retail's not coming back the way that we're used to it. And there's a challenge for residential developers in that a lot of residential developments are are sort of founded on on what they call activation, bringing them to life um, through the stuff that's going on on the ground floor. And typically that is that is shops and coffee shops and um, that that dog's probably not going to hunt anymore so there may very well be opportunities there the flip side of that of course is that its studio providers have been closed for months artists haven't been able to sell their stuff for months if they've been working they've been having to do it in their bedroom uh, or their kitchen so um, the arts uh, the, the creative sector has had a torrid time and you'd say there are have been some sectors you, you, with huge respect to fishing. There have been some sectors that seem to have monopolized the government's attention. And there are other sectors and the creative industries, which are so important to the UK, somehow seem not to be of such interest to the current government. And so I think we are we have a a um, we have a lot of ground to make up. Right. General question now. How can you identify the need for a transformation before your organization hits the buttons? You know, if you're not close enough to the action to spot that before it comes, 
then something's very wrong. And yes, I take it on the chin about the uh, about the environmental transformation that was required about Eden. The financial one, we should never have got ourselves into that pickle. So if you if you need a transformation or a turnaround that's going to deal with those sort of um, those financial fundamentals of an organization, yeah, you really ought to see that coming. The environmental one came as a bit of a surprise, I think perhaps because I, I, I I use the harsh word complacency. We kind of just assumed that everybody knew we were the in, we were on the the right side of the environmental argument, and we we're a little bit surprised when suddenly others started getting traction. But helpfully, you know, we were at least it wasn't like we needed to turn the whole super tanker around. We were in the position that um, that we were doing something we knew about. In hindsight, what would you have done differently? Prioritize more to accelerate change in these projects. That's that's a really, really uh, good question. I think um, I just ran through some of the things that we ended up doing because uh, because we we made them part of the change. I think there are things among that because it's quite a long list. I know there are things among that, notably the geothermal energy project, which have been sort of hanging around with uh, us wanting to do it for a long time. And I think we got to the right place but there were perhaps things that we could have driven along rather faster uh, to get there. But the other thing was, was uh, I guess, the horizon scanning part of it. Now, as a leader, part of my job is, I know it's a, another terrible bit of business jargon, but part of my job is horizon scanning. And I think, I, I mean, I adore Cornwall. I love living in Cornwall. There is a, a, a challenge for you when you live and work in Cornwall that that um, you can you can perhaps uh, become very focused on what's going on in the southwest and maybe maybe we did that and we should have been looking at the international changes a bit more. Management must make increasingly different decisions about the important issues, but they always come with costs or trade offs. What compromises should we not be making now we're in 2021? Come back to the point I made about the points I, I mentioned about decency and authenticity. And the one trade off you can't make here, I think, is is pushing it all on to um, people uh, lower in the organization uh, in the organizational hierarchy. If there is change to be made and if there is pain to be felt in a turnaround situation. Oh, and there is, by the way, because change is change is difficult. It has to go right right the way through. Everybody has to take their bit of it. And the one the one area where I would be completely uncompromising is to say that uh, absolutely throughout the hierarchy from chair of the board right the way through, everybody has to has to be a part of um, of bringing about that change. Um, I think I used the phrase earlier about you, what you want is people who are playing on the pitch rather than shouting from the stands. You, I think as a leader in any organization, you have a pretty good idea quite quickly of who is in each of those categories and uh, and certainly uh, the ones who are on, in the stands are never much fun to be around but in a transformational turnaround situation where there, there tends to be a bit of an emergency you absolutely can't afford them. Thank you very much um, some great questions and some great answers. So that's all the time we have for our Q&A session today I'd like to say thank you to Gordon for today's presentation to Siam Southwest for organising the event and I thank you to you for attending. We do hope that you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express, The Darker Side of Nudging, is on Thursday the 11th of February at 1pm, hosted by the CIM Charity and Social Marketing Group. You'll find it listed on the events page on the CIM website where you'll be able to find more information and to register for the session. Once again, you'll surely be receiving a survey on today's event and we'd really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of Sam, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.